death is not easy to talk about. We don't want to think about it, the finality of it. We'd rather distract ourselves from the ending we know we can't escape. But what if we looked at death as more of a beginning than an ending? Right, like a butterfly can't be a butterfly until the caterpillar dies in the cocoon. I mean, death becomes a conversion, a metamorphosis, a necessary action in becoming a glorious butterfly. Now, could the same be true for us? I mean, that's what Easter is all about. Because of Easter, because of what Jesus has done, death is no longer an ending, no longer a final farewell, a dark and cold conclusion. No, it's a transition a necessary step into a glorious resurrection. Jesus died so that we could live. This is love. As I said earlier, we're beginning a new series today. For the next three Sundays leading up to Easter, we're going to be talking about this is love. Today I'm going to be talking to you about love that forgives our sin. What a powerful love that is. And we'll be talking about the resurrection. Um, next week we're going to be talking about love that conquers death. And then on Easter Sunday the message will be love that makes all things new. So I really hope you can be with us. I think it will, it will open your eyes to a new way of viewing Easter and Good Friday and the resurrection. And, and everything that it represents, not just then, but to us now. You see, we can experience resurrection daily. We just can. So I, I pray that, that you would try to join us. Um, because the, the gist of the point, Max, is that slide available? Um, the, the point is truly that resurrection changed everything. It changed everything. You know, we often talk about the fact that Jesus died on the cross. And that was love. That was a sacrifice he did for us. Didn't have to do it. Jesus was not murdered. Jesus willingly went to the cross. Amen. He knew it was part of his plan. So whenever we become victimized as Christians and say, oh, they killed our Savior. They, no, he willingly went to the cross. That's why he came here. But had the resurrection not happened, we would have no power. We would have no chance. Resurrection changed everything. There had to be the death and the crucifixion. And that was love. But the resurrection gave us hope. It, it gave us everything we need. Not just then, but now. And I, I want to talk to you briefly about that. It's because of the resurrection. We know what the, Christ, what the cross was about. The, the cross was always a symbol of torture. It was one of the most awful ways to die in Jesus' time. But the fact that we wear crosses around our neck is because of the resurrection. It because it represents life and hope. Not, it's not an instrument of death to Christians. It was to Christ. But resurrection changed the whole thing. It gives us hope now. We understand Easter better. And we understand the meaning of Good Friday. Um, a lot of people wonder, why do we call it Good Friday? You know, Jesus was beaten and tortured and crucified and denied and that was a good day? We call it Good Friday? But if you understand the historical part of it, the, the Good Friday it actually represents, it's related to the Feast of Exaltation of the Holy Cross. And what it means is, it, it points out the benefits of Christ's death and not just the awful death that he suffered through. It talks about the benefits. It talks about the grace. It talks about the merits of the cross. And as believers, that's a good thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a holy day for us because had it not been for that Friday, that awful Friday for Christ, we would have nothing good to live for. It truly is a good day. At the cross, Jesus died in our place for our sins. Jesus entered into our pain and our shame and Jesus came and took the weight of all evil from then till today so that his power could be broken. Jesus died to break the power of the enemy. Now, oftentimes we choose to live in that power. We choose to succumb to it. 
But we don't have to. Because of Christ's resurrection, we have the ability to be renewed and to be changed and to be forgiven. And because Jesus didn't stay in the grave, we see that the death and resurrection of Christ is God in his loving, freeing us from sin. He allows us to be forgiven. He allows us to be brought out of our shame and our guilt because of the resurrection. Because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, we see how the love, we see the love of God. When we look at Jesus, what we should say is, this is love. When you see Jesus, that's love. Because no one else, I know what we do for any of us what we did. So I want to talk to you today about the very first part of this, this series. About God loving, God's loving us and freeing us from sin. Now, sin is, is one of those words, like in the church, we use, sometimes we use the word lost. And it's offensive. Uh, people don't like the word sin. What do you mean sin? You know, what is sin? Like? And so it, it, it can be a confusing word. Um, and it's certainly an unpopular word. So let, let me try to explain it with a story I, I got from a friend. Um, so maybe we'll be able to get a better picture to lay the foundation for just a couple points I want to share with you this morning. He told me that he, he was in bed one night and he said, I woke up and I heard a crash. It, was a loud, it wasn't a loud crash, but it was a crash nonetheless downstairs. Before I could peel myself out of bed, I heard the little pit patter of feet running up the stairs. And then I heard Dad, my little five-year-old, said in her moment of innocent, sweet voice, Will you make us breakfast? Uh, he said, uh, sure, but what just happened downstairs? Uh, what was that noise? And she said, well, we were starving. And so we decided to try to make ourselves some oatmeal. So I guessed the rest. Uh, Jane and her older brother Jonas had successfully gotten the oatmeal into a bowl, poured water into it, put it in the microwave for a little too long. And anyone knows a normal human reaction to a five-year-old or a seven-year-old or a 50-year-old is if you reach in and grab a steaming hot bowl, you're probably going to let go of it rather quickly. And that's what they did. They dropped it on the floor and it crashed. Um, he said, I, I wasn't mad about the bowl. Uh, it, was just a, it wasn't expensive and it was old, but I was puzzled. He said, I was puzzled. They had tried to clean up the mess of the oatmeal and the broken pottery with a mop unsuccessfully, and now the mop was ruined. And they actually made it worse by trying to clean up their own mess and not asking for help. I said, why didn't you guys just ask for help? I would have come down and cleaned it up for you. But before they could respond, the answer became very apparent to me. It's hard for people to ask for help. It's hard for children to ask for help. It's hard for adults to ask for help. Um, we always want to try to clean up our own messes mm -hmm. rather than ask for help. That's how we are as adults. We don't want to ask God for help, and sometimes other people for help. We want to try it on our own. We seem to think it makes us stronger, or it's more noble to do it. I'll fix this myself. I'll pull myself up with my own bootstraps. I'm my own man. I can handle this. And in return, we tend to make it worse. And our pride gets in the way. And we know what the Word says about pride, and what it goes before We get embarrassed, we get ashamed, we, we, we feel a little guilty, um, and we just really would rather keep it to ourselves. Asking for help to resolve a mess means that we have to admit we sin, we fail. It's an uncomfortable feeling, and sorry is a very uncomfortable word. We'd rather deny it, ignore it, recover on our own, or even justify our actions by admitting uh, it is, but, but by admitting it's painful. And here's the problem, it won't go away. It will only get worse. History proves that. My life proves that, and I imagine your life proves that. Whenever you try to clean up your own messes, you make it worse or you just hide it. And that's even worse, because it will eventually come out. Our culture doesn't really have a word for what this is when we fall short. We tend to uh, psychologize it, um, psychologize it um, 
our shortcomings, and we, we tend to want to blame them on other things. It, it was my parents' fault. It was my, my upbringing. It was my lack of education. It was my community. It, it's the system I'm in. And although some of those things may be true, it doesn't solve the problem when we fail to own it and not fix it ourselves. It doesn't erase the problem. If anything, it expands it. It's just, it isn't just individuals who have failed, it's all these systems and these communities. And now we're like blaming everyone else. And it's like, well, there's sin everywhere. But the Bible's word for this is sin. It's just sin. And whether we like the word or not, it simply means missing the mark, falling short. It's like if you were shooting an arrow at a target. It's not that you didn't hit the bullseye, you missed the entire target. You know, that's sin. You missed the mark. We're failing to be what God called us to be. It's, it's coming up short with what we thought we could be. And that's when this guilt starts to set in. And see, that's how the enemy likes to use sin. You know, God is not, we don't serve a God of guilt. We don't serve a God of shame. We don't serve a God who wants us to isolate ourselves from other people and not confess our sins to one another. That, that's not God. That's the enemy. He doesn't want you to ask for help. He wants you to own it and make it your own problem and not ask for money for help. Sin is also rebellion. Because God says, when you sin, do this. Be quick to apologize. Be quick to confess your sins. Be quick. But when we don't, it's really being rebellious. And whether we want to admit it or not, it's rebellion. It's a decision to move against what he's asked us to do or even be independent of him. But bottom line is, the ultimate Definition of sin is power. Sin has enormous power if we don't address it properly. The ultimate sin with a capital S that holds us captive and paralyzes us. So there's your intro. Don't you feel better? Like, wow, thanks, Pastor. That was great. I'm so excited about this Easter series. So what do we do about this? What do we do about this predicament? You know, I'm glad you asked. Because here comes the good part. That's the reality. We need to understand that sin exists. And we fall into it easily if we're not careful. Because the Bible says the enemy sets up these traps and these snares. And he wants to trip us. Did you ever have a, a bully in school or maybe it was just a sibling? And you'd be walking down the hallway and they'd, they'd kick the back of your heel and you'd, you'd trip. And that's the enemy. Except he's far worse. He wants you to fall. He wants you to be hurt. He wants you to fall into sin. But thank God he gave us an answer of how we can deal with it. There was a, a follower of Jesus who had fallen short in a spectacular way. In fact, his failure was so dramatic, it was so epic, the story should have been then. His story should have been over at that point. His name was Peter. Many of us are familiar with that. Some of you are studying the book right now. He wasn't just one of Jesus' followers. He was one of Jesus' closest friends. He was the leader of the disciples. And his sin was not just crossing a line for a minor mistake or departure. He literally denied knowing Jesus when it got tough. He just denied it. Three times he denied it. It's no wonder then that Peter decided at that point to go back to his old life. Um, decided to go fishing again. He seems to still be around the disciples, but it's not the same anymore. How could it be? When they heard that Jesus was alive, Peter and John, and I want to just I want you to look at things a couple different ways that you may, may have haven't looked at it this time before. But when they heard that Jesus was alive and the, the tomb stone had been rolled off the tomb, John, the beloved disciple, and Peter ran to the tomb. Now it says in John that Peter stayed behind, running a little slower. John arrived first. Peter was a little tentative. And who can blame him? You know, because it's like, he's alive? Oh, he's alive. And I denied him. 
Um, John, seeing the grave clothes lying there, stained and solid in, in this empty tomb, he believed. Peter, well, we don't know what Peter thought because John never said anything about it in his work. John didn't say it. Jesus appears to Mary, calling her by name. Then Jesus appears to the disciples, passing through a locked door. As if, as if that were enough, Thomas then says, can I see your wounds? I'd like to make sure this really happened. So he shows him his wounds. Was Peter in the room with the disciples then? We don't know. John doesn't say. But then in the next chapter, John decides to give us a long account of what happened with Peter and the risen Jesus. Peter, who seems to still be in contact with the disciples in, in some way, announces that he's going to go fishing. He's kind of going back to his old life. And don't we do that sometimes? When we, when we fall away from what we've been doing to the Lord and it doesn't work out, it's like, well, I'll just go back to my old way of living. And that seems to be what Peter was comfortable with. So in John 21, 3, it says, Simon Peter told them, I'm going to go fishing. And they said, we'll go with you too. So they set out on a boat, but throughout the night they caught nothing. What must have Peter been feeling now? He goes out. The disciples go with him. I don't know if it's out of pity or trying to encourage him or what, but they go with him and they catch nothing all night, and then they come back. He may be thinking Jesus is still alive, but this seems to only make things worse for me. Um, now I know I shouldn't have denied him, but he knows I did, and I have to face him. Again, it's hard to say I'm sorry. Especially when the wrong is as deep as it was for Peter. Unless we judge Peter, we have sinned as sin. And we have denied Christ many times in our lives. In our actions, in the way we live, in the way we treat people. And when we face him, it's hard to say I'm sorry. You see, this is what shame does. Shame makes us think I'm the only person that feels this way and this is unforgivable. That's what sin does. It twists the truth. It denies the power of the resurrection. And it makes us think, I'm unsavable. I'm unfixable. And that's exactly what the enemy wants us to think. Shame isolates us. It tells us that you're the only one. It's uniquely disqualifying. So just live with it. It makes us the exception in a very worst way. We're the one person who can't be forgiven. Shame tells us, Game over. The end. Period. You messed up. Sorry. That's what shame and sin will do to you. And in a sense, it's true. It is a dead end. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. However, the resurrection changed everything. Shame, the kind that comes from actual guilt, is not a liar. It just tells us the story as it stands without Jesus. But see, Jesus stands with us. Jesus did something for us that can overcome any sin that we may have committed. Except denying it. Jesus shows up in the middle of the next day, uh, shows up that day in the middle of Peter's fishing trip. Early in the morning, it says in John 21, 4 through 7. And I want you to see how Jesus approaches Peter. And Peter is afraid to approach Jesus. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. Jesus called to them, children, have you got anything to eat? They answered him, no. He said, well, cast your net on the other side of the boat and you will find some. So they did, and there were so many fish that they couldn't haul in the net. Then the disciples, then the disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It's the Lord. And joy and fear, I'm assuming, rushed through Peter's mind. When Peter heard it was the Lord, and I, I love this, you can study this if you want. It says, When Peter heard it was the Lord, he wrapped his coat around himself. Because he closed around himself, because he was obviously fishing naked, or almost. 
and he jumped into the water. What I love about this moment is that Jesus meets Peter where he's at. Peter didn't have to go to Jesus. Jesus said, I'll come for you. I'll come to wherever you go. I will come for you. Jesus meets him fishing. Jesus didn't just meet Peter there. Jesus reacts, reenacts the scene of Peter's first calling. It was like he was taking Peter back to the beginning when they first met. Back to where it all began. But something is radically different this time. Now the resurrection has occurred. Jesus is alive, not with his old life now. This was a resuscitation. Jesus had raised with a new kind of life. His body had been transformed into a new kind of body. That's part of John's point in telling us things like Jesus appearing in the locked room, eating fish on the beach. There were things about his resurrection body that were different from his previous body. And there were things that were very, very different. Resurrection life is like that. Things change. Things become different. Resurrection life, it's the completion and perfection of all that is good and true and beautiful that we now know because the resurrection can change everything. And it changed the way Peter, the way Jesus called Peter. Look at this. This is a, this is a really powerful point when you notice how Jesus talks to him. When Jesus first called Peter, when he first met, he talked to him about the purpose. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. But this time, it wasn't about purpose. He was talking to Peter as a person. Because he knew how Peter felt. He knew what Peter was going through. He knew the awful, awful condition of Peter's soul at that point. So he asked him, Peter, do you love me? Pretty fair question. I mean, I mean, he didn't say, you denied me, Peter. Shame on you. There was already enough shame on Peter. Jesus knew he had, to, he had to talk to Peter differently now. He had to take that resurrection power he had and resurrect this potentially great man. He said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, oh, you know I do. He asked him three times, do you love me? And he said, then feed my sheep. When we retreat in shame, Jesus will chase us down. He will come after us wherever we are. He loves us that much. He will come after us again and again and again. When, we re when his love is never going to stop chasing us, that's how much he loves us. He says, you can never be plucked from my hand. I will come after you. His love will never stop. His never love will never let us go. But his love can change whatever condition we're in. What Jesus did for Peter, he wants to do for every one of us. You may say, well, I got saved when I was 16. No, I'm talking about today. I'm talking about today. <clears throat> you may have done things last night that you're feeling bad about. You see, his mercies are new every day. He has the ability to resurrect our hope. To remove our shame. To erase our sin. He has that power because of the resurrection. And what he did for Peter, he wants to do for each of us and anyone. In fact, before he found Peter and spoke to him, he had appeared to the disciples. They were in that locked room we talked about, afraid and confused, wondering if Jesus had really been raised from the dead or were they just imagining things. And if so, what it meant for them. So John writes this in John 20, 19 through 23. And notice how Jesus talks to them as people and not the fact that they have failed their purpose. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, first thing he said to them, peace, peace be with you. Because he knew the condition of the soul. He knew the condition of their mind. He knew what they were afraid. He, he knew they were isolated in the room uh, where they'd been told to go. But he, he knew what was going on. He wasn't focusing on their failures. He was focusing on them and their, what they needed. And he does the same for us. 
When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they will be forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it will be withheld. The risen Jesus breathes new life, the life of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, he breathed it into his followers, and he still does. He still wants to, if we'll receive it. But sometimes before you receive it, you need peace. You need, you need to know you're not in trouble. I mean, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell the story of when they were in the boat, and there was a big storm going on. Jesus was napping. And, you know, the disciples were like, well, how can he sleep? We're all going to drown. And he wakes up, and he, he looks at the storm, and he says, peace. He's still. And he can do it to the environment, and he can do it to us. Peace. Peace be with you. If you're living in shame, if you're living in guilt, peace be with you. Peace be upon you. And you cannot truly walk in this resurrection life without the resurrection of Christ within you. And that comes through the Holy Spirit. And he wants all of us to receive that. He doesn't want us just to know about God and know about Jesus. He wants us to have a personal relationship with him. And that comes through the Holy Spirit. Because of the resurrection, sins can be forgiven. And the power of sin that kept us bound, that paralyzes us and held us to the same patterns of failure, now it's broken. It's broken because of the resurrection. Peter's life changed that day. He went on to lead, he went on to lead the start of a movement that would be called the church. He preached boldly and he suffered greatly. He shepherded a flock of believers and taught them what it means to be forgiven and free. A deep love for Jesus anchored him on those, even during his most difficult days. And it all began the day Jesus found him on the shore, and he restored him. Friends, your and my life can change today. The whole trajectory of our lives can change today. Maybe you've been living your life like it's game over. It's the end. It's not. Today can be a brand new beginning because of the resurrection. I've got good news for you. It is not over. Because of Easter, all things can be made new. All sins can be forgiven. All of us get a second chance. The scripture tells us that God showed his love for us because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's Romans 5.8. While we were enemies of God, while we were stuck in sin, while we were caught in a trap, Jesus came. Still can and died for us. Before we knew how to call his name, God came running after us. God comes running after you and me, just like he came after Peter. Today can be your day. Today can be your day. Every day, if we accept that resurrection power, it can be our day. This is love. And it changed us. Amen. Amen. Let's bow together. Uh, we're going to receive communion this morning. It's a, it's a nice reminder of the season we're in. Because scripture tells us that on the night Jesus was betrayed, he did this with his disciples. And he knew he was going to be betrayed. He knew there was a betrayer in the room. He probably knew there was also a denier in the room. But he did it anyway. So if those who are going to serve us communion, please come up and... We'll pray. He doesn't care how we do it. Some churches use little wafers. Some churches use these little chiclets. Some people use these little plastic cups. I, I don't think he cares. I think he cares why we do it. What it means to us. Because of what he did for us. So let's stand together and pray. And then we'll come, come forward and celebrate this. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacrifice you, you made for us. We thank you, Father, that this was leading up to your crucifixion. You were about to be arrested, falsely convicted, beaten, and crucified. And this represents that. You were telling us that this is my body that's going to be broken. This is my blood that's going to be shed. Every time
time you do this, you remember that. You remember what you saw, what you want to see, and what it stands for. It stands for power. It stands for forgiveness. It stands for a new chance. And had it not been for the resurrection, this would have all been in vain. But we thank you, Father, that you're not a man that you would lie. What you said you were going to do, you did. And now as we stand before you, Father, I ask that you would help us, help us inspect ourselves. If there's anything in our lives, as your word said, if we forgive people, they're forgiven. If we don't forgive them, they're not forgiven. But your word also tells us that in the accordance that we forgive people, we need to be forgiven. So, Father, if there are people we need to be forgiven right now, maybe we need to make some phone calls today. Maybe we need to write some letters today. Maybe we need to have some conversations with people today. But, Father, help us to forgive greatly so we can be forgiven greatly. Father, inspect us. If there's things we need to stop doing, help us to stop doing them. If there's messes in our lives that need cleaned up, and we're just making them worse, please take it and fix it. I know you want to and you're willing to. And as your family comes to the table right now, Father, I pray that you would remind us what you did and how much you love us. And that love will never stop. And we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Jesus was betrayed. He broke bread. He said, this is my body broken for you. He then took a common cup of wine. We use juice. It doesn't matter if you use wine or juice. But we use juice because sometimes the, the little ones take it with us. And he said, this is my blood shed for you. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. So please, come on.
pray that this season we would begin to look at resurrection power differently. Your word says that when you came to the earth, you came just like us. You were human in every form. Yet you didn't say. But after the resurrection, something changed. You weren't the same anymore. You didn't walk through doors before the resurrection. You, 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 didn't, you didn't talk to people and go after people the way you did. You always loved us and loved people. But you showed us how to be forgiven and how to have hope after the resurrection. May we experience that this season. And as we enter into the next couple of weeks, may we, follow, may we fully understand what they represent and how much you love us. This 